Hey, everybody, it's Carter, and welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the conversation series where I sit down and have chats with lovely writers of all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, so today is the first day of summer. It's very nice here in Colorado, um, and I just had a lovely Father's Day. Uh, my, my, my girl is back home from college, and my son is still in high school, so we went. Uh, we played top golf. We hit some. Uh, we hit some golf balls, and I uh, had some lovely food at the top golf facility. Followed up by uh, seeing Top Gun the movie. So uh, a, a day of tops. Uh, Top Gun the movie was uh, was a pretty special. Top Gun Maverick, uh, the new Tom Cruise movie. So I think that's the second time <laughs> in the last three years that I've been to a movie theater. So it was very nice. Um, and yeah, and then my kids are just trying to figure out what to do with the rest of their summer. My my daughter actually got a job. She got a job working at a coffee shop, um, which she's already completely overwhelmed by. And I think she's very much looking forward to getting back to college. Um, so today on the show, speaking of writers of all sorts of different backgrounds, I had on Hilda Lisiak. So you may or may not know her name, Um but she is an American journalist who publishes the Orange Street News. So she started – here's the kicker. She started this newspaper when she was seven years old. And it actually got pretty well known very quickly. It started a newspaper in um, in Pennsylvania. Um, and she's also the youngest member of the Society of Professional Journalists. Um so she's she's a bit of a wunderkind, uh, and I had a great time talking to her. She um she actually has a book series uh, as well, a ch children's book series with Scholastic, and uh, Apple TV actually did a whole series of uh, TV mystery series inspired by her life titled Home Before Dark, which premiered I believe in 2020. Um, Hilda was also awarded a Junior Zenger Award for Press Freedom in uh, 2019, given to a journalist who fights for freedom of the press and the people's right to know. Um, so it was really cool. Uh, you know, when she was pitched to me uh, to be on the show, I, I, I didn't know who she was. And I looked her up. I'm like, wow, this, <laughs> this person's really done a lot um, in a very short period of time in her life. And she has uh, huge goals uh, and, uh, and was tremendously fun to talk to. Plus, when I interviewed her, we both happened to be wearing Nirvana shirts. So I guess that made me feel a little bit young and hip all over again. Um, and she actually has a new book out um, called Hilda on the Record: Memoir of a Kid Crime Reporter. So, kind of a little bit of a, a little bit of an autobiography uh, about you know how she got to be where she is now uh, at, at the <laughs> at the ripe old age of 15 years old. Um, so, yeah, a very very accomplished guest. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I certainly did. This is my conversation with Hilda Lisiak. How are you? Good. How are you? I am well, thank you. I was uh, looking forward to to talking to you. Um, so first of all, let me contextualize everything. So where where are you? You're you're in Arizona. Yeah, I'm in Arizona right now. Right now, I'm at my grandma's house. Yeah, uh, yeah I live in Arizona now. Uh, yeah, because you were you moved there from from Pennsylvania, right? Right, and then I moved um, to Pennsylvania from New York. Oh, oh, okay. So what was what was kind of the the reasoning behind moving to Arizona? Um, I think my parents just kind of wanted a change of scenery. Uh I don't really I'm not I'm not the biggest Arizona fan to be completely honest, but um <laughs> <laughs> everyone else in my family really likes it. That's good. What 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 exactly are you not the biggest fan of? <laughs> I really like I really like cold weather. Oh. I like the seasons changing. Um, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. You don't get a lot of that in Arizona for sure. Yeah. And I think, are you wearing a Nirvana sweat sweatshirt? Can I just ask? Is that what that is? I am. I, I was noticing that we both have the matching Nirvana. That's really, that's really bizarre. We both have Nirvana outfits on. Okay. Well, I, so I'm old enough where, you know, I was probably 20 <laughs> when, when Nirvana hit the scene. And I, I have a specific awesome. memory of like walking at night 
in downtown San Francisco with my Sony Walkman on, so my little cassette player Walkman, and listening to Nevermind and just be like, what is this? This is amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, yeah, that was a long time ago, a long time ago. So, I'm, a, I'm a big Nirvana fan. Oh, good. So this is a little bit of a different uh, interview conversation series episode for me because so I normally talk to writers of all sorts of di different backgrounds, whether fiction, nonfiction, journalism, poem, poetry, whatever. And I'm always interested in the origin story of, of people, right? Like, how did you become who you became? And, and, you know, with writers, a lot of writers I talk to, there's kind of that point in their, their childhood that, you know, books were my best friend because my family moved around a lot, or I was in the library all the time or whatever. So with you, you're you're kind of at that inflection point right now because you're what, you're 15. Yeah, I'm 15. <laughs> okay, uh, and I, I can relate a little bit because I have a 16 year old son and an 18 year old daughter. Um, but but none of them have done any. <laughs> that sounds rude. I was going to say none of them have done anything substantial in their life, but that's not true at all. Um, so maybe maybe for the benefit of of the listeners and the viewers, if you could just walk me through a little bit about kind of what you what you started when you were seven and to kind of how that's blossomed into where you are today in terms of, of writing yeah, and, and journalism. Sure. So my dad was a journalist when we lived in New York. And since he was gone so much, he would take me on some of his stories and we moved to Pennsylvania and he had quit his job and he'd become an author, which made me realize like how much I really liked journalism because I really missed it. And I missed going with him on these stories. So I figured that there was nothing stopping me from just starting my own newspaper. So I could do mm -hmm. the same thing. Um, I, you know, I hear a lot, like people have, you know, that point where it's like, oh, I'm going to be a writer. But when I was younger, I never really, I was never like, I never really wanted to be a journalist. It was just a hobby for me. Mm -hmm. I always like, I wanted to be like a veterinarian or an actress, or a chemist. Like, those are my three things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is a pretty wide-ranging uh, subject, but sure, you could yeah. wrap them all into one big thing together. So when we moved to Pennsylvania and he quit his job, I realized how much I missed reporting, so I started my own newspaper. And my first issue was on note cards, and I, like, wrote it down on crayon, mm -hmm. and it was really just... Um, <laughs> It was really just like, really, I don't know what the word is, unprofessional, I guess. <laughs> but I realized really soon after that, that I wanted to have a serious newspaper. So I went to my dad and I asked him if I could use his computer because I didn't have one, if I could use his computer and his printer so I could do the layout. And then I printed, I think my first like official printed issue was my little sister being born. <laughs> so <laughs> big headline news. <laughs> I printed yeah. Um, so I printed probably 50 copies and I went around and I knocked on every door in my street and I gave everyone a copy of it. Wow. A free paper. Now, didn't your dad already warn you that the yeah. <laughs> that the newspaper industry was dying? And so you create a paper that you gave away for free as your business model? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't paying for printing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, no one really cared about the newspaper at all. They just thought it was kind of cute um, until I started. I started reporting on vandalism because there was a lot of vandalism in my town. And, and this since, is Pennsylvania at the time. Yeah, and since the adult newspaper was covering like um, a few different towns, they didn't really think it was important but it was really important to the people. So when I started covering vandalism, I got a lot of sources and I got a lot of people who would like tell me when they had information about it because I was the only person who was reporting on it. Got it. Okay. And so, and were you, were you the one who was producing the articles you were doing all the writing? Yeah, I did all the writing and the reporting. Um, I wouldn't ever let my parents go in and interview with me. Occasionally, I'd let my older sister because she filmed for me, but I was just like, that was so out of the question for me. Yeah, yeah. So were you were you like tracking down vandals and getting like anonymous uh, people like on your own without your parents asking them about uh, their artwork? Yeah, there were a lot of situations where I really wanted to report on the stories. And my mom was like, no, you are not doing that. Like, there's That's no a good way. mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember one time specifically, um, this was like a few years later, I'd be like nine or 10. 
um, I was reporting, I was doing an investigation on a drug problem at my local like middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. And somebody had reached out to me and they offered, offered to take me on a drug run with them. If I kept them anonymous, <laughs> I was so excited, but of course my mom, I mean, yeah. I think I saw my dad considering it, but no, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. And I mean, I it's, not understand why at the time. Right. But I hope you, are you learning I now? Like, now. <laughs> it's funny when you say like, you know, when I was younger, I didn't really know I wanted to do this. And now that I'm 15, this is the path I want. I didn't start writing till I was 33. I had zero business writing. And I just, I just, it just happened when I started writing when I was in my thirties and now I've, I've got eight books out. Um, but it's the point being is like your life, Jolie just goes through these monumental unforeseen shifts but as you're looking at what you've started to to where you are now is first of all are you are you continuing the paper continues i assume it doesn't actually oh oh <laughs> yeah um, plot twist. Plot twist. <laughs> <laughs> my parents actually made me quit it about a year ago to focus on school and everything okay which at the time was very devastating but i, I mean i completely understand now um, I think I focused a lot of years of my life on journalism and I kind of, um, it's like when you're so young and you have a lot of people telling you like, you're so special for doing this, like one particular thing. It's tricky to stop doing that even totally. when you're not like as interested in it anymore. Uh, especially being that young, it's like, I don't, I really, right now I kind of have no idea what I want to do. Um, I think I might want to be, um, a biochemist engineer. Like mm -hmm. that's my thing right now, but that could change a week. That's so my, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to focus on my other interests, all of that stuff, but I'm sure I will return in writing one day. Well, for sure. I mean, that, that makes, that makes all the sense in the world to me. I mean, because you said it right for all, all the kids who don't know what they want to do. There are some who have a focus, but that doesn't mean your focus is going to stay the same. It, 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 you know, it's, I know so many people who like, you know, I went to college for this and then I took this one class randomly and that lit me up. Like that was what I wanted to do. And I never saw that coming. So, so you never know. Although with something like biochemistry, you have to have a pretty good idea because that's, that's a long, that's a yeah. long tough slog. My, uh, it my, is my niece is that's my niece's, um, uh, what she's studying and getting her PhD in, and it's, that's, oh, that's awesome. You gotta have a certain that's type so cool. of a certain type of brain for that 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 I don't have. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, writing. Um, and as you know, you're interested in you you or at least were interested in journalism. Was it break down for me kind of like what you liked about the job in terms of the in, investigatory journalism versus the actual writing and the craft of, of, of journalism. Yeah. So with journalism specifically, so I have like, even when I was really little, ever since I could write, I was writing these like journals and I just, I loved writing. I would write a lot of short stories and everything. Mm, okay. And I loved like fiction writing and that type of writing, but with journalism, it was really the reporting and talking to people that i loved. It was like writing it almost, I kind of not dreaded, but it was just like not the fun part for me. Mm -hmm. I love talking to people because it's just journalism is a very different style of writing than like sure. short stories or fiction or even like journaling. It's, it's very, um, you know, objective and all these things. Uh, but what I love specifically about reporting was it was just so exciting because it's not the same. Like it's a completely different thing every day, which was so fun for me. Right, right. And did you have other people um, contributing to the paper or was it just you? It was just me. I, I had occasionally I would have some people like send in a short story that I'd publish under their name, but that happened probably three times. It was really just me. Okay, got it. And so you mentioned you mentioned some of the creative writing that you've done and you mentioned your father you said was is an author as well. What does he what does he write? Um, he writes a lot of different things. Let me think. Recently, he wrote a book um, about Matt Drudge. I don't know if you know him. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He wrote The Drudge Revolution. Uh, that was like his most recent one. He's working on like <laughs> three right now. I'm pretty sure that I'm not sure I can say. Um, he does a lot of, I think, a lot of like nonfiction. Okay. Okay. But he's some fiction books too. I'm like thinking back. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Oh, that's okay. My kids, my kids have barely read, ever read anything that I've produced. So you don't, you don't have an obligation until you're like 20 to, to start paying attention to what your parents do. Um, so are you continuing, uh, in terms of you, you apparently, you, you seem to have a need for a creative outlet. Um, are you, do you continue journaling? Do you continue writing? Yeah, I journal a lot. I write a lot of short stories. I really like writing scary short stories, which is weird because I don't like scary shows really or hmm. like movies. Like it really freaks me out. I mean, I still watch them, but I'm not a fan. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I journal a lot. I write, I draw, like that type of thing. Um, yeah, I feel like I feel, I don't know what it is about me, but I feel so like, like almost like I'm in a straight jacket when I can't express myself creatively like mm -hmm. my mind will just stop functioning do you have you know you, your father's a writer uh and a journalist do you have um kind of other family members that are that have that kind of same creative you know push that that you seem to have yeah my mom is an amazing writer oh. she's actually she's good she's um she like does mainly fiction and short stories mm -hmm. but she is a great writer she also um she has really she has a lot of um constructive criticism <laughs> so i'll always show her something i write and she has a lot of good advice for it, even if it's a little bit unwanted at the time <laughs> <laughs> well well hildy that is a very mature attitude because uh criticism and rejection is is a, a tremendous part of a writer's life and yeah. you can take it you can take it a couple different ways you can let it just completely defeat you and i know a lot of people that it's just you know hey this publisher didn't want my book you know i'm going to give up um but if you're passionate and it and if you are kind of i'm a storyteller no matter what you see that rejection as like yeah totally how you phrased it it's advice it's like why wouldn't i you know that doesn't mean you have to take the advice yeah, you, you should listen to it. And you should be curious about it. Because you have enough people saying the same thing. You're like, Okay, maybe maybe my ending isn't great or whatever it is. So that's Yeah, but it, it's, it's for me, it's the ending. <laughs> it, it's hard when it's your mother. I, um, <laughs> my mother, I give my mother, uh, my mother reads all my books, um, kind of, um, kind of when they're they're before they're published so they're in the advanced review copy phase and she's got a great eye for typos and stuff like that and she read my latest book and she's like this is the most disturbing book i've ever read <laughs> she emailed me That's she's awesome. like i didn't find any typos because i think i was like too bothered by the content i'm like okay <laughs> Um, but like, it's easy for me to say this now, but at the time, like when, if my mom like gives me criticism, like for the, like an hour, I'll be like, you just don't understand. But then I'll have to let fix it. Right. <laughs> After it wears off a little bit. She's like, <laughs> I don't understand. Look at all that I've written. <laughs> I think I, I, I think I get it. Um, but you're so 15. So, right. So you're just, you're freshman or finishing up your freshman year. 10th grade. 10th grade. Oh, okay. Sophomore. So you're you're getting close <laughs> you're getting close to those 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 college years my son just took the sats uh last week um but and you you know and i don't think kids should necessarily know what they want to do because to your point like you have a lot of different interests but is 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 pursuing an english degree at all interesting to you or or, or a degree in journalism or not necessarily i think an english degree but the thing is, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think I would do journalism, because I think um, I think I could learn more. Like for me personally, with journalism, by like you know going out and doing it more myself. English, I have considered just because. But here's the thing: I don't really know completely what I want to do, so it's um, it's like tricky to try to figure out. But I, the reason I consider English, it just sounds so fun. Like, it sounds like such a fun thing to study. We just yeah. like read books and do all, all that. That sounds fun. But I'm keeping my options open. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of considering to do. As you should. And it doesn't sound like you have a lot of pressure from the family. Sounds uh -uh. like, you know, they're very, you know, follow your heart. You know, maybe I'm making an assumption, but that's kind of the vibe I, I'm getting from them. Yeah, completely. Um, I So I skipped a grade, right? So I'm going to be graduating when I'm 17. Mm -hmm. And my mom's always like, you know, Hildy, like, if you don't feel ready to move out, like, you can just stay with us for another year. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> so you you want out? <laughs> oh, yeah. Completely. Do you want you want to go to a, a, a out of state or? Oh, yeah, way out of state. Um, maybe <laughs> even out of country. <laughs> 
wow, you really don't like Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, if I if I went to school in the U.S., I'd want to do East Coast, like New England area. Yeah, yeah, that, that's for sure, for sure. That's I went I went to school in upstate New York, and I was, grew up in in Los Angeles, so it was a big shift for me. And I, oh, I can imagine. Oh, but it's amazing. I think, and and my my daughter went out of state for college, and she, I think it just you you just you it's such life lessons you know yeah so just to be away from home and to and to you know have to deal with that which is not not necessarily an easy thing mm -hmm. um but you you're going to go into college with kind of these experiences and these opportunities that you know um a lot of other folks don't have so for example it, it seems like you know you really got propelled to the limelight uh with with your journalism and then um there's like a show based on you. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, yeah. So it all happened pretty quickly. I, cause I didn't, cause I was, I mean, I have Instagram. That's pretty much it. I don't like, I don't really do social media cause I'm that's not good. good at it. So that's, no, I, that's good. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think I'm missing much. Like I have an Instagram and that's like, I feel content with that. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't, and I wasn't even really on Instagram then when everything started to happen. So I kind of had no idea that like, when I, um, so I knew when I reported on the murder, I got backlash for it, but, and then so, I posted. So, so tell me about the murder reporting. Cause I don't think we covered that. Oh yeah. Um, so one day I was covering a different story and I had gotten a tip. I think it was, I think it was a phone call tip. And they told me that there had been a homicide of just like a few blocks from my house. Oh, wow. And at first I thought it was completely fake because it's a town of 4,000 people. Nothing really much happens, you know, hmm. but I knew it was worth checking out. So I biked down there and it turns out that this man had hit his wife over the head with a hammer, but he had had a stroke. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> he had had a stroke a week earlier, which, you know, like affects it was all it was a whole thing, you know? Yeah. But I was the first person of the first media outlet to report the story and get it up. I had it up, I think, within a matter of like three hours. But I got it up. I got it up before any of like the other like adult media or anything. And immediately after, obviously, I got a lot of backlash from everyone in my town. You know, why I should be, I should be having tea parties? I should be playing with Barbies. I shouldn't be. I should not be doing this. I'm a little girl. I shouldn't be anywhere near a crime scene. Huh. You know, all of that, all of that stuff. So I made a video reading a lot of the comments I got. And that kind of um, kind of blew up a little bit. But the thing is, I didn't really know because I knew I got backlash from the murder because I heard my parents arguing about it and all this stuff. <laughs> um, and then, like, my mom kind of sat me down and told me everything. But when I posted the YouTube video reading people's comments, I didn't know, like, it, like, blew up at all, really, until – because I remember that night um, – the what was it I think the air conditioning in my room wasn't working so I was sleeping in my older sister's room and we were watching like Gilmore Girls or something mm -hmm. and she checks her YouTube and she's like Hilsey like you need to see this like your video is like kind of going viral right now and I'm like what <laughs> so I look at it and it was and that was it and viral for me was like you know like a hundred views so I'm like oh my god right. and then I went to bed and I didn't <laughs> think about it um and so yeah I kind of blew up and then I had a few, you know, I got a few media requests from that of people who wanted to interview me, which was very, very strange for somebody who mm -hmm. been interviewing other people. Um, let me Were you uncomfortable people. with those interviews, like just talking to people? Yeah, because I would find that I would, I'm just like a really curious person and I would start asking them questions and I'd have to like back myself down and be like, he'll be like, they're doing their job. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like stop harassing them. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was super, it was super weird because I don't know, I always thought I liked talking about myself a lot, but then you actually do it. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. This is not for me. Um, uh, let me think the TV show. I think that came about when I was like 12. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay. I remember specifically, it's so like, there was talk about it and all of that. And um, what exactly happened? I remember we were on the call with Joy Gorman, the producer, and everything was still super up in the air. 
and I was on the call with uh, her and my parents and my parents called me in the room because they're, they're trying to fill me in on everything. If I want right. to do this, it's like a whole thing. Right. And I am just preoccupied because I had a theater performance I was in hmm. <laughs> like that day. And I didn't want to be late. So I was like trying to be as polite as possible. I'm like, hi, like, cause I, I don't know. <laughs> I was just so preoccupied. I was like, hi, like, I'm so sorry. I, I, I gotta go. Like, he, like my community theater is counting on me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, it all happened pretty fast for me because I wasn't really, that was kind of a ramble, but what I'm trying to say, it all happened really fast for me because I didn't really pay attention to a lot of it. And then I would just look back like a month later and be like, oh my God, that's actually really weird. I can't believe that happened. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. When you have time to, t- time to put everything in context, what's happening, you're not kind of maybe appreciating, you know, yeah. what, a, what a bizarre situation. So tell me, but tell me, what is this show? Oh yeah. The show is for Apple TV plus it had two seasons and it was basically centered around like a fictionalized version of myself and my family and um like my life being a reporter but it had a whole like fictionalized um story and it had a mystery it was it's it's pretty good i'm very biased but i I do recommend but it's so bizarre so they basically you know kind of bought the rights to to tell your story were you involved with any of the um scripting or anything like that I wasn't really directly involved with scripting, but um, I, I'm like, I was, I'm still pretty close with all the writers. Uh, they would call, they would fly me and my dad out to LA, my mom sometimes, and they would talk to us for like five or six hours and like pick our brains about all this stuff, which was super, which was super fun, honestly. Um, I'm Brooklyn Prince, who's the girl who plays me in the TV show. She's like, we're still super close. She's like my little sister. We talk a lot. That's awesome. She's, remarkable i i i just like the idea of writers listening to this podcast and just seething with anger at (laughs) everything that you've accomplished and they're everyone's still trying to like just you know get published and they're in their 60s so you know that (laughs) it it will be interesting to see as you progress through life if it makes anyone feel better i'm seething with anger looking at some of the stuff i didn't appreciate more (laughs) like when i was yeah i mean that's life that happens to everybody you never really have a, a you know and especially in a writer's life it's so hard to achieve kind of anything that even when you achieve something small and you get paid hardly anything for it that's still way more than what a lot of people ever achieve in it but it is sometimes hard to look back and and have that gratitude so i it's, it's an important thing to try to practice like wow this is pretty this is pretty amazing um and then you and you also have some books that you're writing for scholastic is that correct yeah, this was this was before the show. I think I was ten when I wrote these. Um, there were six total. It was um, a book series called Hildy Cracks the Case, and it was centered um, around my life as a reporter. And they were like every book was based on real stories I actually reported on. I mean, they were all fiction, right. but they were based on real stories. So I was just like trying to make like really fun and interesting to like seven, eight year old kids. Got it. So you, you, you wrote those stories, those books. Um, yeah. I mean, I had a lot of help from my dad, especially with like the first few, because I was 10, I have no idea how to format a book or do any of this stuff. But, um, you know, like by the end I was like writing most of them. So was Scholastic telling you, you know, we need a book and it needs to be, you know, about this many words and here's the deadline and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, but it's like, you know, a lot of it went through like my agent, my dad's, my dad would just be like, hey, like you need to have what, I don't even remember how many words. It wasn't right. too much. Like right. they were like, what, like 15 short chapters, yeah. you know, it wasn't anything extensive. Right, right. Well, that's, that's pretty amazing. So, uh, you <laughs> yeah. know, not only did you have that, the, the, the paper, but you're, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> a published author with a, a TV show based on her. So that that's pretty cool. Do you have, did you find when you were writing those books, like, you know, that, that satisfied, uh, your creative outlet, do you find that you're, you know, or did it, was it a springboard? Like, I, I I'd like to do more of this, or are you just ready to kind of do non-writing things? I don't know. Um, like, I think it was super, that whole like time period of my life was super fun but I feel like where I am now I can't really go much further with it 
I think when I get older, I totally could, but I feel like I've done, I've done what I should be doing for now. And I think it's good that I'm kind of focusing on like more normal kid things, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just trying to take things like day by day, which is very cliche, but you know, focus on school and all of that stuff. That's a lot to focus on for sure. I mean, but you like, you said you like to write kind of some, some dark stories and, and I know, uh, you know, dark young adult <laughs> sells huge. <laughs> so if, <laughs> if, if you've got that, if you've got that idea, um, I could definitely see a book deal a Netflix deal uh, for, for a, a dark Hildy story in the future. <laughs> I appreciate the vote of confidence, <laughs> but I used to publish like really dark short stories on my website and oh. I would get like some like people who were like, Hey, like just making sure everything's okay at home. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't worried when you were being like a murder reporter. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that was fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Hildy, we're going to wrap up. Before we do, we're going to do a real quick storytelling. I, I have, I have three books in front of me, and I'm going to have you choose one of them, and, and you're going to choose a random page and a random sentence. And then I'm going to read that sentence, and then you're going to give me a sentence or two, whatever you want to do for what happens next after that. And then I'll do a couple sentences and we'll just go back and forth for, for a couple minutes. Um, so, then, so I just kind of randomly picked these off my bookshelf. So I've got, uh, they're all novels, Harlan Coben's six years, um, Stephen King's the dead zone. Oh, I want to read that. That's good. Uh, and William Goldman's uh, the princess bride. I've read that. So good book, good book. it is a good book. I, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go with the Stephen King. Okay. Good choice. How many pages is it? Uh, give me a, a page between one and 400. 52. Okay. And give me a sentence between one and five. Three. Um, okay. All right. So I'm going to read this and then you're going to continue the story. Um, or if okay. you want me to go first, whatever you want to do. Um, okay. Possibly he had already called the cab driver's wife and the dead boy's mother to, pa to pass the news. Possibly here. I'm, I'm going to let you take the, take the first sentence. Sure. That one. Sure. I'm going to read this sentence again. Possibly he had already called the cab driver's wife and the dead boy's mother to pass the news. If not, he would have to tell the dead boy's mother himself. And that's something he really didn't want to do because she would have a lot of questions. Mostly, why was my boy out at night with you? That's a good sentence. Hang on, let me think this over. <laughs> sentence, could you repeat your sentence? Oh, no, I probably can't. So uh, hmm. the idea is that he doesn't want to have- He was to with the- He was with the kid. Something had the kid died somehow, and he doesn't want to have to tell the mother the kid's dead. Yeah, because he was with it, and that's too many questions he can't answer. Right. Something I think. Hmm. And if you don't want to do sentences, you could talk about what might happen next without having to do actual sentences. He could feel really guilty because he was the one who was involved with the with the death somehow, and he could like completely freak out and kind of flee, like the right. scene or wherever he is right so maybe the idea is that it was an accident um mm -hmm. there was no maliciousness involved um but the kid That's who right. died was out with him and they were out um they were out vandalizing pennsylvania <laughs> so what so how did it happen so they're out you know the the dead kid doesn't want to be there doesn't want to be Go ahead. They could be kind of like messing with each other. Like the dead kid doesn't want to be there. He's like, come on, just like do it. It's fine. And they get into some sort of altercation. And it's not like a super malicious one, but like um, the dead kid kind of falls in the road and then the cab driver comes and into Oh, him. oh. Except for talking about the cab driver. Yeah, yeah, the cab driver. And the cab driver was on his phone and he wasn't paying attention so he was yeah, distracted. Yeah, so he didn't see any of their altercation. So he could totally blame it on the cab driver if he wanted to. Did the cab driver stop or did he take off? I, th I think he stopped because in the first sentence, he was talking about telling the cab driver like what happened, what actually happened. You Got know, 
Right. So I think he kind of stayed and he was like, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we ended on, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> Well done. See, now that's that that's a start for a for a little dark story for your website, where people can question uh, what's wrong with you. Yeah, totally. And you'll if you become kind of a, a dark fiction writer, I can tell you for the rest of your life, people will ask you um, what happened to you as a child. And now you've got these that. great stories. <laughs> I do. Awesome. Well, Hilde, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. And it's, uh, it was very eye opening for me. And I'm very excited to see uh, what you do next, even if it's just uh, paying attention to school. And I, I appreciate <laughs> you taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's so fun. <laughs> Take care. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Bye. So that was my conversation with Hilda Lisiak. Uh, it was awesome. She was super interesting to talk to um, and has <laughs> has a lot of advice and has learned a lot uh, from starting her paper and all her different endeavors. And it was just fantastic to, to, to sit down and, and have a chance to uh, chat with her for a little bit. Uh, I would like to plug her website, but I, as far as I know, she doesn't have one. Um, so if you want to find out more about Hilda, just Google her name, Hilda, H-I-L-D-E, Lisiak, L-Y. S-I-A-K, and there is a ton of information about her uh, on the internet, including her, her webs or including uh, Wikipedia page. And, you know, just to mention again, she has a new book out, Hilda on the Record, Memoir of a Kid Crime Reporter, and that is out and available now. If you want to find out more about me, you can just go to carterwilson.com and find out where I'll be next and uh, sign up for my newsletter. I would certainly appreciate that. And most importantly, please, for the love of God, buy all of my books. That would be amazing. You would be my best friend forever. Uh, that's it for now. More episodes of Making It Up coming out soon. In the meantime, thanks for watching and listening. Take care. Take care.